start with a simple thing. Guys, anybody here know Greek? Greek, Greek, no Greek? Um, anyone want to guess what this says in Greece? Yeah, yeah, but I think it's, it's pronounced as gniti sieftion, know thyself. Now, <clears throat> these two words you're probably familiar with. Um, they loom over us with a foreboding authority. For here in these two words, we have crystallized perhaps the entire wisdom of the great civilization of Greece. Know thyself. Oftentimes we see it as attributed to Socrates. The idea is pretty simple. Like if you want to have a meaningful life, an authentic life, a joyful life, you need to get to the root of your essence. You need to know yourself. Um, or this is, at least this is what I long believed. And probably you've all heard this, and there's actually a big problem with this adage. The Greeks themselves didn't really have a word that meant self, at least in the way that we know self. Um, it's insofar that these two words were actually inscribed on the temple to Apollo at Delphi, which is legend said that they were, it's unlikely that that meant know thyself in the kind of self-helpy way that we think about know thyself. In fact, they probably meant something more like know thy place. I mean, this was a sacred place. It was more like saying, you know, put on your best tunic, put down your wine, mind your manners, you're entering a sacred space. And this is the interesting thing. For most of human history, the best piece of advice you could probably find or follow is know thy place. Most people lived in small tribes that were tightly, tightly bound by custom and convention. Um, people didn't really ask, you know, what should I do with my life? That was already predetermined for them by their role in the tribe. They didn't really ask what makes me happy because they didn't have a lot of choice over it. Their lives were basically about sustaining their existence or living as their myths told them. They didn't wonder how do I find love. Their marriages or other relationships were already pretty arranged. Most of human history was really just know thy place. But in the 16th century, all of this, at least in Western Europe, started coming undone. When Copernicus established that the Earth was not the center of the universe, um, when Descartes began sort of investigating into the rational basis of his own consciousness, when Darwin realized that basically we are the outcome and the byproduct of a random sort of escalation of evolution, all of these things really started undercutting and un upending the medieval traditions and customs that held Europeans together, together for so many centuries. And this left us in a real crisis. As the philosopher Max, Max Scherer basically said, ours is the first period where man has become completely and totally problematical to himself. When he no longer knows what he is, but at the same time, he knows that he knows nothing. This is our dilemma. And this is the real question for us. For how is it that we are actually supposed to know this self? Now, when I was growing up, I think I heard know thyself from my English teacher in my senior year of high school. And she assured us that this was going to be the pathway to wisdom. And I think when I was in college, most of my college classes, in some ways, particularly in the humanities and social sciences, were really about finding some ways to an authentic way of being. Because if I couldn't find this, I would simply be living according to somebody else's program. If I really wanted to find freedom, happiness, and liberty, I needed to find myself. So this begs the question then, what is this self that we're actually supposed to find? Is it our bodies? Is it our minds? Is it what's the sort of thinking part of ourselves? Is it our consciousness, this experience of being that we're commonly inhabiting? It's not exactly clear. So when I was trying to figure out, okay, how do I know myself? What should I do? Where should I go? How should I find the answers to this eternal question? And of course, I went to the fount of all great knowledge and wisdom in our contemporary era, went to Wikipedia. And I typed in, okay, what is the self? And this is what Wikipedia gave me. The self is an individual person as the object of its own reflection, reflective consciousness. Since the self is a reference by a subject to the same subject, this reference is necessarily subjective. 
The sense of having a self or self-help should, however, not be confused with subjectivity itself. Okay, that's not really great. Um, so maybe there were some other ways of trying to understand the self. Uh, so I went around cruising throughout the internet and kind of found out what other definitions of what the self might be. Um, a person's essential being that is distinguished from others, especially considered as the object of introspection or reflective action. An individual's typical character or behavior. Uh, your sense of who you are deep down, your identity. A person's experience as a unitary being separate from others. An archetype of wholeness, the regulating center of the psyche. These are all sort of ways that you see people defining the self. Notice any problems with some of these definitions. Well, let's take the first one, essential being. Well, what's not essential about your being? Do you have an unessential being? Uh, character, what is it that defines character? How do we know what character is? Um, your sense of yourself deep down, how is deep down more than up high? You can begin to see these, a lot of these are sort of metaphorical descriptions that aren't really very clear for us. So we can go and look around other parts <clears throat> of the modern era to try to find some wisdom on this. If you go to sort of the more business kind of oriented places where they talk about sort of knowing yourself and empowering yourself, you oftentimes see these Venn diagrams. If you want to know yourself, find where you are in this Venn diagram between your passion, your competence, and of course, market demand. Um, well, that might necessarily be very use useful. Then there are, of course, scores and scores of books that are loosely called self-help books. And these are offerings that sometimes are very useful and sometimes are not very useful. And they aim to help us do certain things like better manage our time or win friends and influence people or accomplish our goals. But they all share one common problem. They actually never define what this self is that they're actually trying to help. So what we're going to do in this class is we're going to tackle this question of the self. And what we're going to be looking at are kind of key things. What the self is, why it doesn't function necessarily as we would often like it to, and what we can do to make it work better. And our approach <clears throat> is going to be sort of very multidisciplinary. Um, when I started teaching this class, I didn't really have the self as the object of inquiry in mind. Uh, I came to Chicago 20 years ago, and one of the great things about teaching here is that they basically, outside of our core curriculum class, let us teach whatever we want. And I was interested in psychoanalysis, I was interested in Buddhism, and I was interested in neuroscience. And so I put together a class that just put these readings together. And my wife, Thea, said, oh, you should call the class shit I'm interested in. Uh, and I thought, well, okay. I'll maybe figure out a little more respectable title. And after teaching it for a couple of years, I realized this was actually a class about knowing the self. So that's why I renamed it The Intelligible Self. And what our approach is going to be is to try to apprehend this notion of self. How do we understand this lived experience that we're currently inhabiting? How can we understand the forces that are shaping us, are shaping our consciousness, shaping the ways that we understand our own being in ways that maybe are not in our control? How can we gr gain greater mastery over this whole experience of life? So let me start with a definition, basically, of where we're going to go forward, which is, what is the self? Now, I think the biggest problem that we have when we try to understand what the self is, is we believe that the self is a thing. And this makes sense, because how we normally understand the world is in terms of things. Um, it's an intuitive way of making the world certain and solid. But the self is not a thing. The self is a process. In, in particular, the self is a process that negotiates between our internal life force and our external reality. And let me explain that a little bit more. Um, basically, <clears throat> All of us has what I will call a life force. Now, it may sound kind of mystical, and I'll talk more about it uh, later on, but it's not mystical. It's actually based in physics. All of us is an energy system at our core resisting entropy. And this <clears throat> way this energy system gets perpetuated through, at the base level, through metabolism and through, through more macro levels, through all of our adaptations, psychology, culture, life stories. <clears throat> 
All of these things are basically ways that ourselves use to negotiate with reality. And, but under, underneath all of that, an underscoring and fueling and motivating that is a life force that's basically there. So what we're going to try to understand are, within the self, what are these layers by which the life force is negotiating with reality? How does this build up? How does this, and then more importantly, where do these begin to malfunction? Why is it that so much of our lives are spent in experiences or states of anxiety or resentment or anger or pain? Yes? Why is that Good question, and we'll come to that. And I, the, the quick answer to that, though, is it's malfunction because a lot of our experiences of pain, anxiety, resentment are inappropriate for the circumstance that we're in. We actually carry around a lot of inefficient emotions Freud called these neuroses, um, and they basically dominate our lives. We actually, and I'm, I'm no different, all of us spend a lot of our times distracted or inefficiently expressing the energy within us. And what that oftentimes means is that we are cut off, and this is going to sound kind of wooly, but we are actually cut off to a deeper luminescence that is coursing through our existence. Because within all of you is actually a vibrancy a vibrant, energetic thrum that most of the time is not available to your ordinary conscious experience. And why is it not ordinarily available to your experience? Because you're so distracted with all of the microdramas and all of the other self-processes that you think you need to basically negotiate with reality, but in fact are not that necessary. And if you really, really want to live well, it's important to try to find ways of accessing that luminescent, luminescent effervescence, which is your birthright. Now, that's a tall order. You know, there are monastic traditions, for example, that spend decades and decades or lifetimes, if you believe them, you know, in pursuit of evoking this essence from within. But we'll talk about it. And I think there are other ways that we can at least learn to live easier uh, and at least learn to sort of... <clears throat> maybe just enlarge the vocabulary of our own experience at the very basis. So when we're thinking about the self, though, let me go back and talk about where it's malfunctioning and how it could work better. Think about the self as a series of concentrically elaborating processes. And they're much like a set of Russian nesting dolls, each one kind of elaborating and building on an inner core. And at the very core of this self, the very heart of who we are, is what I would call the cellular self. This is what traces back in our evolutionary lineage at least four billion years when the first life forms emerged. And what did the first life forms have to do? Basically, they were energy metabolizing systems. These little microbes, these little cellular structures were in place, and they were doing basically what all life do was doing. They were processes of energy. They were energy systems. They were sustaining this metabolic fire and keeping it going and keeping it going and keeping it going. And they basically evolved to do this through a cellular structure, a cellular membrane that would encase it all, and a system of cellular parts and organelles that would sustain this. Imagine it being like a fire. And the life itself is the fire burning, and the self were all of those processes that allowed that fire to keep itself going and to keep re reproducing over time. And so something that really links us to all life on the planet is this, the cellular self. It started with our microbial ancestors that existed uh, several billion years ago, as David Christian talks about. The one that we know about and we can say for sure is LUCA, which stands for Last Universal Common Ancestor. Um, and this ancestor basically bequeathed to us this cellular self. And the primary purpose of the cellular self is to resist entropy. Now, moving forward a little bit, so that's going to be the first layer of self, and we're going to talk about that somewhat, this lecture and next lecture. The next layer of self, or the next elaboration of self, comes probably around 600 million years ago with the development of multicellular life, and particularly multicellular animal life in our case. That's most interesting. And this is what I would call the animal self. Now, the interesting thing about multicellular life is you've got a bunch of cells that are coming together, coexisting, creating themselves as a single unitary entity 
what do these cells have to do? They have to find a way of coordinating with themselves. They have to find a way also of negotiating with reality as a group. And basically, in the case of animals, what that meant was the evolution of neurons and of perceptual devices. And the most important thing that your animal self does is make a map of reality and try to predict of what's going on. And it basically does this through a whole suite of different specialized organs within your body and a whole set of psychological processes that are innate to you. But all of this together is basically you and what your animal self wants most, which is to make a prediction about what's going on around you in order to help you act and operate better in that environment. And so if you look at all animals with neurons, and basically any, any animal more evolved than a sponge um, basically has neurons to it, that's what they're doing. And that's what we do at our core animal self. And what's more about our animal self, though, and this is, I think, the key thing to know about this, is that the animal self gives us this illusion of being a unitary, singular being. Innately, we kind of consider ourselves to be stable, unitary, singular, but this is not what's going on. You're comprised of 36 trillion, trillion with a T, cells. Each of those cells are coming together in kind of a wonderful symphonic kind of coherence to get, generate this experience of being you. But the other interesting thing is not only are these cells doing this together, you're also doing it with all other animals. The animal self, particularly your mammal self, but pretty much all animal cells, are interdependent with other animals. So going back to the earlier point, who we are about a self, we think of ourselves as solitary and individual. In fact, that's an illusion. We are fundamentally interconnected with each other. All of our self processes, particularly in a social species like ourselves, and particularly mammals and then primates like ourselves, are highly, highly interdependent upon the selves of others around us. And so this is going to be the big challenge of the animal self for us. How do we know to make our animal self work as well as it's supposed to work? And how is our animal self supposed to be working as well as it can? So that would be all well and good. If we were just our animal selves, we would be kind of hanging out in some, you know, probably some savanna in East Africa. Um, you know, scavenging food, maybe getting together, throwing rocks and trying to hunt some bigger game, uh, fighting amongst each other, ourselves all the time, trying to establish dominance hierarchies uh, the way that basically primates do. But something really changed with our species that differentiates our species from every other life form on the planet. And that's the next layer of self, the linguistic self. And probably only it's only about 100,000 years old where humans really started having language as we know language today. Um, now, what is the linguistic self trying to do? Well, if the cellular self is there trying to resist entropy, elaborating on that is an animal self that thinks and feels and makes predictions about the world. The linguistic self is there to label and judge. For being human really means living in a symbolic community. We are fundamentally dependent upon language for our survival. We cannot exist without it. We have been shaped and, have, and he've evolved to actually live with language. And as you acquire language, it fundamentally shapes your brain. Your brain is, as you're born, is a plastic entity that wants to absorb language in order to incorporate it into your self-processes. Now, the challenge, as we'll see with the linguistic self, is that it also allows us to, to do certain great things. It allows us to make rules and laws. It allows us to build technology and culture. And even more interesting, the linguistic self allows us to make ourselves into who we might want to be. Animals really can't change themselves because they don't have a means of reflecting on themselves. They don't have a means of understanding or introspecting in the way that we do. What language allows us to do is to become introspective. And in doing so, gives us the opportunity to reshape ourselves in a way that we, we see fit. This then learns, leads to the next layer of being, which is what I call the egoistic self. Now, if the linguistic self is about living in a cultural community that's sort of shared by bound norms, traditions, the egoistic self is much more individualistic. It's basically the part of ourselves that's there to help us negotiate with others. 
It's all about our rights and entitlements that we think that we deserve from other people. And sometimes these can be outsized when, someone, when we say that someone's being egotistical. Sometimes they can be undersized when we say that someone's being self-abnegating. But more often than not, the egoistic self gets turned around sort of various stories, myths, narratives about who we are and how we are existing in relationship to other people. And more often than not, this is where our self-processes really start to go out of, out of whack. It is around the stories that we tell ourselves. Now here's going to be the challenge for us, or the interesting part of this, this exploration. These three layers of the self are all kind of empirically available to us. We can observe cells, we can observe our animal processes, we can observe language, culture, norms, rules. All of these things, because they're observable, allow themselves to be open to some kind of scientific inquiry. The egoistic self, by contrast, does not really allow itself. We don't really know that the ego as such exists. We have some speculations, and as we'll get to it, there's some descriptions in neuroscience that are beginning to suggest how the ego gets formulated in the brain, but this is still very nascent, nascent science. Really the way that we know about our egoistic self is through our stories. The myths and stories that we use to tell ourselves about who we are, how we explain the day's events, how we situate those day's events into a larger story of our life. How we in turn then situate that larger story of our life into a grander story or myth about what our purpose for being is. All of these regulate around an egoistic self. And ultimately what the egoistic self is there to do is to give us the things that I think we really, really want most in the world, which is to be respected, loved and admired. So this is typically then where the self stops. Most of the time when we think about ourselves, we think about the egoistic self. We think about this part of ourselves that's so consumed with our conscious life stories and we equate, we typically equate ourselves with our ego. This sense of I, me, Eric Oliver, professor, this is who I am, this is myself. I know a lot of you in, in your written responses to the questionnaire when I ask like, you know, what you were, you immediately start marking, you know, I'm a sister, I'm a runner, I'm a student. These egoistic kind of markers here. But this is not totally who you are because there's one other layer that I think the world's w wisdom traditions basically tell us that exists that we're going to try to explore. And this is the transcendent self. And the transcendent self exists to basically try to reconcile and rectify all the dysfunctions at the other layers of being. The transcendent self there is, exists to help you kind of go beyond what is ordinarily there, to try to live and function in a better way. It's about sort of realigning our self processes so they work in better harmony. Now, there are many, many kinds of paths to transcendence that are out there that people talk about. And so, one of the questions that then we have to ask ourselves is, well, which path should we follow? How can we know about this? There, with all of this variety, it's very, very confusing. So what I'm going to do is suggest hopefully what's a simple and kind of clear way of understanding how, what transcendence really is about. And it's about self-organization. And this actually takes us back to the cellular self. All selves basically have to do two things. They have to, on the one hand, keep themselves ordered. They need to have a structure to keep the energy coherent, contained, and regularized. In single-celled organisms, this is the cellular membrane, this is DNA, this is organelles. This is the whole structure and process that keeps the cell alive. On the other hand, all living things need vitality. They need to actually express this energy within the energy system itself. So, Order and vitality, vitality and order, like kind of like yin and yang, these are sort of two fundamental core processes of the, self, of the self. And the task of our self is to try to keep them in some kind of balance with one another. We want them to sort of be optimally configured so that we have just the right amount of order and just the right of my, amount of vitality <coughs> expressing itself. And for most living creatures, if you look around the world, this 
balance between order and vitality is honed by evolution. If a cell basically has too much order, it will be stifled, it becomes sterile, it won't reproduce. If it has too much vitality, it will unravel in cancerous disarray. If an animal has too much vitality, it's going to be inefficient. It's going to burn itself out. It won't sort of regulate its own metabolism and its own energy stores in an appropriate manner. If it has too much order, it's going to lose out on food and other reproductive opportunities. So the question for us is how do we maintain balances between order and vitality? Because once we moved out of our animal self and we moved into a linguistic self, the normal ways and the natural ways and the ways that evolution had sort of basically honed order and vitality within our species began to be upended. Once we could organize ourselves and order ourselves relative to laws, customs, and traditions of our own making, once we could sort of fashion technologies that, begin to, that could begin to sort of shape our own self-processes, it allows us to sort of not only make rules about how we're supposed to behave, but to in fact follow those rules and internally follow those rules. And this is the other kind of key factor about the linguistic self. It enables self-regulation. It enables us to basically internalize the rules and norms of the communities that we're brought up in and the cultures that we're brought up in and monitor our own behavior relative to them. One of the thing, reasons why you are as successful as you all are, that you've come this far, is that you are extraordinarily adept at self-regulation. What it takes to be a student at the University of Chicago, the amount of studying that you do, that you willfully take upon yourself, the amount of discipline that you pull into yourself to stay up late at night studying away for some uncertain outcome in the future is remarkable. But what is the cost of that? That's not a natural way of being. And the question that we must ask ourselves is, and I'm that way too, I mean, I'm a professor here. God, I've got neuroses for days. Um, what is the cost of that? What does that do to our way of living? How does that distort how we go ordinarily experience reality? And I think this is what we begin to see. With the linguistic self, we begin to see big imbalances between order and vitality within us. Not only do we become ordered over concerned with things like order, rigidness, uh, cleanliness, um, our vitality begins to express itself through a lot of unproductive emotions, guilt, anxiety, depression. And so how do we go about then sort of trying to understand this? Well, a lot of this imbalance doesn't necessarily manifest itself on the cultural level, although we, we do that sometimes and we can see and question our own cultural assumptions. More often than not, it happens in the egoistic self, where a lot of our concerns and imbalances and anxieties really take hold is really about this ego. Um, how are we sort of expressing this ego in the world? Now, this is a kind of a new phenomena. If you go back and look across time, you know, most people, their ego was highly constrained by their role in the tribe. If you grow up in a traditional society, you're basically, your ego is there, but it's pretty much the contours of it are, are prescribed for you by the customs and norms of your society. So you're brought up to be a hunter, or you're brought up to be a mother, and that's who you are. That basically tells you what your rights and privileges and responsibilities should be. And that's pretty much as far as it goes. Yeah, you struggle with other people, you have to negotiate with other people, some people are more powerful, some people less powerful, yeah, 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 that's there. But all of this is still very, very tightly constrained. And most of this is also defined by myth. The interesting part of a traditional egoistic self is how deeply it's organized and informed by the myths and customs and rituals of these societies. If you go to any sort of traditional pre-literate society, uh, there aren't that many anymore, but the ones that exist, they are constantly engaging in rituals. Whenever they go on a hunt, whenever they prepare a food, whenever they do some village sort of event together, whenever there's uh, say a female has her first menstruation. 
All of these things are highly ritualized. They have some sort of rite. They say a prayer. They make a sacrifice for this. This is the way they fully ensconce their being. It's very, very tightly bound. We, on the other hand, are unbound by all these traditions. That doesn't mean, though, that we still have our myths. We still have, and we're still a society that's in constant, constant myth and stories. Think about the stories that you probably grew up with here. These stories, as we'll see, all tell a very similar kind of tale. It's what's known as the monomyth, or the hero's journey. It's about a tale of self-transcendence, but it's still a myth. These will influence who you are and how you go about thinking about yourself. And then, of course, we take this one step further. We have social media. And this is a totally new thing. I hear, I, it's, you know, you guys grew up with social media. For you, it's just sort of like this is what reality is. This is a remarkable new technology. I don't know any time in history where so many people were so concerned with what so many people they didn't know were thinking about them. And a technology to be able to project some sort of self-image and get some sort of feedback in this sort of imaginary electronic space is really astounding. And so the question is, is what are our technologies, and this is a real key thing that we're going to need to focus on here, what are our technologies doing to us? What are they doing to this order between, this balance between order and vitality? To what extent are we spending so much energy, time, and concern checking out what's going on on this little device? It's really remarkable. So then this begs, the, I think, the bigger question. Um, how can we find transcendence then in a classroom? I don't know. Um, most of the way people find transcendence is by going out, taking psychedelics, or doing meditation retreats, or having some sort of other peak experience. And I can't really, we'll do some of those, not all. <laughs> At the very least, what I'm gonna hope to do, as I said before, is expand the vocabulary of your lived experience. What we can do here through readings, exercises, and our group discussions is begin to have a greater sense, or at least a greater set of tools by which we can interpret what's going on within us. Um, so one of the things that we're gonna, basically this is what we'll be doing in the second half of the class. So the first half of the class, we're gonna be investigating these various levels and layers of the self. And then for the second half, we're gonna be sort of saying, okay, what's, what are the mechanics going on behind them? So we're gonna spend some time thinking about how thinking works and what consciousness does. Um, how this basically operates uh, within us. We're going to try to get at what is the difference really between happiness and satisfaction? What does it mean to have a happy or a satisfied life? How can we go about doing that? Because we are also interdependent beings and because ourselves are so interdependent, probably the most important thing for us is this quality called love. So we're going to spend a week on how do we know love? What is love? It turns out it's a kind of an elusive and slippery subject. So hopefully by investigating how our thoughts and consciousness works, how our feelings arise, how we find love, we can begin to sort of see at least some pathways towards realigning order and, vita uh, order and vitality within us and finding greater transcendence. Because ultimately what transcendence is it's about finding a better, better balance between order and vitality. I think if you look across almost any spiritual or philosophical tradition, they will, their advice will ultimately boil down to that. It's about order and vitality.